this week's drive, we mark the passing of a legend, get back on track with NASCAR, see an unlikely off-roader, and climb a very wet stairway to heaven. All this and more in this week's Drive. We start at the Fiorano test track, home of the Ferrari Formula One team, for the unveiling of their new contender in their brand new GES logistics building. Essentially an evolution of last year's world championship winning F2002, the new car will be known as the F2003 GA, the GA being added as a mark of respect for Fiat's patriarch Gianni Agnelli, who died last month. In a slightly somber ceremony, both Ferrari president Luca de Montezemolo and world champion Michael Schumacher dwelt on the contribution made by Agnelli in the revival of Ferrari's fortunes. The new car is the successor to the formidable F2002, which was beaten just once last season, as Michael Schumacher swept almost unchallenged to his fifth World Drivers' Championship, with teammate Rubens Barrichello romping home a comfortable second. Agnelli, who symbolized the glamour and promise of Italy's post-war generation and oversaw Fiat's takeover of Ferrari, died on January the 24th, aged 81. Agnelli, whose grandfather founded the company in 1899, became Fiat Managing Director in 1963 and Chairman in 66, a post he filled for 30 years. The men who will be behind the wheel of the new Ferrari were purring in anticipation of racing their new machine. However, Ferrari's challenger for the forthcoming season won't be in action until Formula One reaches Europe, but Schumacher believes last year's car will still fare well in the opening rounds. The F2003 GA builds on the F2002 in terms of improving aerodynamic efficiency, lowering the center of gravity, and maximizing the performance available from the Bridgestone tires and the 052 engine. However, many areas of the car had to be fundamentally reviewed in order to make a step forward in performance, because these areas were close to the limit of development on the F2002. Agnelli appointed De Montezemolo as company president and saw the team win the last four Constructors' World titles in succession and take Michael Schumacher to three drivers' crowns. It is on behalf of all the men of Ferrari that we want to dedicate this car to a person that we miss and that I personally miss a lot. The team's second driver is enthusiastic about the tool he'll use in this year's campaign. When the car was turning, I mean, I couldn't stop looking at it in, in, in a way that every lap was a different thing that I found it on the car. So it was pretty emotional in, in a way. I mean, it's such well, well done on, on the back of the car. It's, it's, it's really nice. New rules for Formula One come into effect this year. Perhaps the most significant will be separate, solo timed practice. What does Rubens think of this? I love it. I think it's a fantastic idea. For, for, for one reason is the traffic. I mean, um, you remember so many other times we used to have uh, Monte Carlo or even Hungary. It used to be so difficult to do, to complete one lap. So this is great just to be on our own doing a lap in Monte Carlo is going to be very, very much fun. Rival teams Williams and McLaren are working hard to close the gap to Ferrari and have shown good results in pre-season testing. Is Michael worried? Yes. Yeah, no, honestly, uh, I'm concerned about their pace. Brother Ralph drives for Williams. Does Michael get any useful feedback? Uh, you know, he, he's, he keeps his mouth as close as, uh, <laughs> as, as concrete. No, he, he doesn't say anything, but uh, obviously the times, they, they sort of indicate what's going on. The side pods, radiator layout and inboard rear suspensions are all new improving aerodynamics and cooling efficiency. Development on the front wing, turning vanes, brake ducts and revised rear suspension components will be tested in the next three or four weeks. Ich bin sicherlich sehr beeindruckt vom neuen Auto und so wie ich das auch auf Italienisch schon ausgedrückt habe. I'm definitely very impressed by the new car. As I said in Italian, I've fallen in love with this car because it was a big surprise to me that one was able to change the car so much and I hope for the better. That is still to be seen.
So I'm extremely curious to step into the car and to test whether it is as good as it looks. I think the season will be very exciting when one sees how McLaren Mercedes have narrowed the gap between us in the winter. For that reason, it will be very interesting. The gearbox is a development of the previous one, but is shorter, narrower and lighter, and gear selection has been refined for a faster gear shift. The power steering system has also been redesigned, and a version was tested during 2002. Close cooperation with Bridgestone gives better matching between tyre and car, and has produced a revision of both front and rear suspension. The inboard end of the rear suspension has a new damper system, and almost all the suspension components have been refined. Many are made from new materials and manufacturing methods to reduce weight. The Jordan team has named Ralph Furman as the new driver. Long before we were in Formula One, we used to send most of our drivers to that championship because for us it's a great schooling. They learn so much about the tires. Furman is 27 and another unusually tall driver at six foot one inch. His father, also Ralph, was a mechanic for triple world champion Emerson Fittipaldi before founding the famous Van Diemen mark, whose chassis have been raced in junior formula like Formula Ford by many of today's top drivers. Well, I'm delighted to have got the seat, and obviously they've been talking with the team for the last month, and uh, it's just been a case of uh, finally getting the, the go-ahead, which is incredible. In 1993, at just 17, Furman won nine rounds of the British Formula Vauxhall series. A karting champion, too, in the same year he also won the McLaren Autosport magazine Young Driver of the Year award. Furman is the reigning Formula Nippon champion, claiming four wins in the ten rounds and the title by just two points. Furman spent six years in the Japanese series, which replaced the local Formula 3000 championship in 1996. Past title winners have included Toro Takagi, Pedro Dal Rosa and Ralph Schumacher. He had previously won the British Formula 3 championship at his third attempt and won the 1996 FIA Formula 3 World Cup in Macau. Jordan has had his eye on Furman since he left for Japan. Uh, I wanted to look at him and take him on as a test driver six years ago, and that wasn't possible. He went off to Japan. And, um, of course, the fact that he won the Formula Nippon Championship, which is a big Japanese championship, brought him back into the limelight. Um, and that really was the main reason. I also wanted a mature driver, somebody who'd been around a while, knows about, you know, the knocks that you get as a professional. And um, at 27, I suppose he is a mature, considered to be a mature driver, but nevertheless young enough for us to be able to do what we really need to do with him. Despite the long delay in making the announcement of Furman's contract and the possibly linked aspect of sponsorship from tobacco giant Benson and Hedges, the cars have been undergoing development and testing during the off-season. For this year, the team has Ford engines and Furman has been driving the car at the Valencia circuit in Spain. His first race in Formula One will be the Australian Grand Prix. What will his strategy be for the race, which often favours midfield teams? Not to crash. <laughs> I think stay out of trouble the first corner, and with the extra point system this year, scoring from sixth down to eighth now, I think it's a great opportunity for teams to be able to score races, more points, not only at the first race but all the way through the season. Whereas uh, in the past, it's been difficult to compete with the, the top teams. And what are your views on the driver aids that are disappearing? Perfect for me. Um, never been used to dry raids, and I prefer they weren't on the car. So looking forward to hopefully my talent shining through and uh, and being able to move further up the grid once I turn them off. Manfred von Brautich, seen here with double world champion Mika Hakkinen and his teammate David Coulthard has died aged 97. Von Brautich was the Mercedes driver who gave the 1930s Silver Arrows team their first Grand Prix win at the Nürburgring. He won the French Grand Prix at Reims and was the last living link with the golden age of pre-war motor racing.
Van Brakitz was the winner at 110 miles an hour. That's modern racing. In 1937, Mercedes fielded a four-man team of Caracciola, Van Brautich, Herman Lang and the Briton Dick Seaman. Monaco was a track that he enjoyed, and it is ironic that the ragged Van Brautich would win at the circuit that demands the most precision. Everyone expected a routine Mercedes 1-2, but Van Brautich had other ideas, setting a new lap record. Team chief Neubauer signaled him to stay second, but the rebellious driver only stuck out his tongue. Caracciola answered with another record, but soon had to pit for new plugs. He made up the gap when Van Brautich pitted for fuel and tires. As he rejoined, Caracciola appeared, and they screamed off side by side, but Van Brautich squeezed into the lead. Caracciola set a lap record that wasn't equaled for 18 years and took the lead, but his tires were shot and he had to pit again. Van Brautich crossed the line first to end his three-year windless drought. In 1951, he was suspected of spying by the West German government. He was arrested, but while on bail, he defected to East Germany, leaving behind his wife. In a final tragedy, she committed suicide a year later. Van Brautich was close to the modern Mercedes racing team throughout. He was one of the first to congratulate Mika Hakkinen's first world championship in 1998. In a new format, 19 starters in the 25th non-championship Bud Shootout raced for 20 laps, then took a 10-minute break in which crews could make changes before the final 50 laps. After the break, Dale Earnhardt Jr. battled with Matt Kenseth. The pair exchanged the lead five times before Jeff Gordon, who started just ahead of Earnhardt at the back of the field, raced to the front. It took Gordon until lap 56 to get in front, with Earnhardt fourth at the start of lap 66. He took the line at the top of the banking and with some drafting help from Ryan Newman, took the outside line on the high banked two and a half mile oval and charged to the front. Gordon pushed his Chevy hard for the last five laps trying to get back past Earnhardt, but he couldn't catch the third generation driver. It was only the second time Earnhardt had qualified for the non-points race, featuring the previous year's Winston Cup pole winners and former shootout champions. Last year, he finished second to Tony Stewart. Earnhardt, who won $205,000, beat Gordon to the finish line by 0.18 seconds, about four cars lengths. There were no caution flags, and the winner averaged 180.827 miles an hour. Kansas finished third, followed by Newman, last year's top rookie. German car maker Porsche used its new test track next to the factory in Leipzig to launch the new KN 4x4 model. The test track has a separate area built on 200 hectares just for KNs. The track itself is FIA approved, which means it's likely to be used for racing soon. Two models of the new all-purpose powerhouse will be offered, the S and the Turbo which accelerates from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 5.6 seconds and reaches a top speed of 266 kilometers an hour. To the purists, a Porsche sports utility vehicle is almost unthinkable and represents a dilution of the purebred heritage of a high-performance sports car. For example, it's the first Porsche to have more than two doors. It doesn't help that the KN shares its platform and some of its components with the Volkswagen SUV, the Taureg, the last Porsche VW collaborative vehicle, the mid-engine Porsche 914, wasn't exactly a howling success. However, while the VW splits its power 50-50 front and rear, the Porsche sends 68% to the rear wheels for traditional Porsche oversteer. The KN Turbo is powered by a Porsche-designed 4.5-litre twin-turbocharged V8 engine rated at 450 horsepower, but it has no connection to the engine from the old 928. The KN has a standard six-speed Tiptronic S transmission and full-time all-wheel drive, an interaxle differential lock and low-range gears for steep trails, plus the Porsche stability system for maintaining control on slippery surfaces. Not surprisingly, acceleration is blisteringly quick. Porsche claims it will get from zero to 160 kilometers an hour in 12.9 seconds, which is a third of a second quicker than the factory's claim for the Boxster S. If the worldwide success of the BMW X5 and Mercedes-Benz ML off-roaders is any indication, the high-performance KN is going to sell up a well-heeled storm. Porsche suggests that the KN, especially the turbo, will put the sport into sport utility. The luggage and load space in all its variations offers no particular surprises, being a fairly standard design which offers maximum flexibility of use, but retains the body's structural stiffness so as not to compromise ride and handling. 
The interior, accommodating and comfortable, is beautifully finished, much better than the insides of a 911. The only interior parts shared with the Volkswagen Taureg are the steering column stalks, although the general layout is similar. Apart from an array of instruments and digital information between the widely separated rev counter and speedo, the ergonomics are superb and equipment levels very high. The latest generation Porsche communications management system, standard on the turbo, works quickly and logically. The KN is a fairly big vehicle. The turbo version is 4.8 meters long, 1.9 meters wide and 1.7 meters tall, with a wheelbase of 2.8 meters. It weighs 2.3 tons and the boxy body has a drag coefficient of 0.39. If you don't need quite that level of performance, the visually almost identical KNS might fit the bill. It has a normally aspirated 4.5-litre V8 delivering 340 horsepower and will go from 0 to 100 k's an hour in 7.2 seconds. The extensive experience of marathon rallying with all-wheel drive road and rally cars is being exploited by Porsche to connect the KN with Porsche's heritage. Porsche has been at the forefront of all-wheel drive design from the Lona Porsche to the 959 in 1985 and the current Carrera 4. Porsche has been engineering four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive vehicles for a very long time. While responsive and competent on the road, the KN is equally at home in the rough. An air suspension, like the all-wheel drive system, is controlled by switches on the console. It offers three settings, although many owners will ignore it and leave it in the normal mode. Ground clearance can be varied by 116 mm to a maximum of 275 mm with the optional advanced off-road technology package. The suspension even allows the anti-roll bars to be decoupled to increase suspension travel by another 60 mm. Production of the KN is a real collaborative effort. A manufacturing network which includes the main Porsche factory in Zuffenhausen in Germany and Volkswagen plants in Braunschweig and Wolfsburg in Germany and Bratislava in Slovakia. Sheet metal pressings come from Wolfsburg, axle and suspension components from Braunschweig, and the body shell is built in Bratislava. The heart of the SUV, its engine, is built in Zuffenhausen, where engines are currently produced for all the other Porsche models. Like many of the new breed of high-tech off-roaders, some time-honored bush driving techniques will be overtaken by technology, and some owners may need to relearn how to drive their new toys. A true Porsche, the styling of the KN is characterized by muscular wheel arches, the distinctive Porsche family headlights, the V-shaped bonnet, and the overall design of the vehicle typical of the mark in every respect, despite being the first five-door, five-seater Porsche ever built. Proximity sensors are standard front and rear, which will be welcome news to anyone likely to scratch that expensive paint on rocks, trees, or supermarket trolleys. Porsche will build 25,000 KNs during the first full year of production, split 70-30 in favor of the S model. 70% of production will be exported. Saudi-born rally champion Abdullah Bakashab has revealed the new car with which he will mount an assault on the Middle East Rally Championship title, currently held by arch-rival Mohammed bin Sulaim. At a dazzling ceremony in Dubai, Bakashab and his Irish co-driver Bobby Willis unveiled the tried and tested Peugeot 206 World Rally car to replace their aging Toyota Celica. Bakashab last won the Middle East Championship in 1995 and participated in the World Rally Championship until last year when he was convincingly beaten by 14 times Middle East champion Bin Sulaim. Does he need the new car to win? I think yes, it's vital. But this year I'm very optimistic, God willing, for many reasons. First, the car has won three world titles and we are hugely supported by Peugeot itself and from Mr. Jean-Pierre Nicolas personally. He gave us guarantees to win this championship. The team is very strong. We also have a great engineer. His name is Reno from the Italian team. 
He made many drivers world champions. Sponsors have also put in more money to bring in this car. These are things that make me optimistic, especially when the times we recorded last year were good, despite the bad luck in the old car. This is a new page, I hope. Team manager Nick Galino said that they'll rely on Peugeot's experience in rallying. So I think it will take a short time to to set up a car in a proper way for the for the Middle East Championship conditions. The old Toyota Celica couldn't cope with the rough terrain and the heat on the regional series, mechanical failures forcing him out of the Syria, Lebanon and Qatar rallies. Bakashab won the Middle East Rally Championship Group A in 1995 and the Group N title in 93 and 94. He will contest five rounds of this year's Rally Championship and possibly one event in the World Rally Championship. The first event in the Middle East series is the Qatar International. Barcelona's San Jordi Stadium saw 12,000 fans for the fifth round of the Indoor World Championship. But for Englishman Dougie Lamkin, it was a disappointing day. The 11 times world champion could only manage third place and relinquished the lead in the title standings. Adam Raga, riding in his home Grand Prix, started the day just a point behind Lamkin. He won the French round two weeks ago. He made light work of the awesome waterfall section and over the qualification lap accrued just 16 penalty points compared to Lamkin's 23 and current world champion Albert Cabastani's 25. His countryman Kabastani ruined his chances on the high jump section and appealed to officials. Despite his protestations and the partisan booing of the crowd, the replay clearly showed Kabastani's back wheel bringing down the top bar of the jump. Unfortunately for the paying public, that meant that Raga had a three point lead and therefore the final runoff became a formality as he wasn't taking any risks. Capistani was able to showboat a little, knowing that the second place points were already his, while all Raga had to do was to avoid disaster to chalk up his third win of the season. The Gas Gas rider won his first ever indoor trial in this arena last year. Raga's second win in 15 days gives him a five round total of 90 points, four ahead of Lamkin and 13 over the defending champion. And finally, ahead of the start of the new racing season, we felt it would be a good time to look at how things can go horribly wrong when you're out there and giving it 11 tenths. There are many old sayings in motorsport, and one of them is, you want publicity, then you need to win or crash. Here are people who've decided that they aren't likely to win, but need the publicity. Crashing often loses you places and always costs you money. Take it from someone who's done it a few times. But the good news is that with racing safety regulations, most drivers get to walk away from what look like major league crashes. Typically, there are many ways to describe a crash and how and why it happened. These include soil sampling and going to the beach. Although race engineers and pit crew generally take a dim view of the hapless driver who wrecks the cars that they built for him. And no matter how bad the off may look, one thing is constant. Racing drivers can't wait to get back on the track. So, whether you crash out of tunnels, pound through puddles, or rip up the tarmac, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.